So to kick us off, I'd like to welcome Julia Jones, Head of Analytics at NZX, to share her perspective on what opportunity, opportunities exist for New Zealand's sheep industry and the role breeders play in impacting that future. Thanks, Julia. Thank you. Um, I'm now, what's, what's, how, do the, how do the slides get up there? Do I have to share my screen again? Yeah, yeah, go for it, Julia. Cool. You'd think I hadn't done this before, but um, you'd think after a couple of years of this, we'd all be absolute experts. Um, look, firstly, thank you so much to everyone for taking the time to listen um, in the evening to me. I'm going to try my hardest not to be boring. Um, I can't make any guarantees, um, but please feel free to throw questions as I go, uh, and then they'll get answered at the end. Um, look, I just wanted to start off explaining, I guess, these are just my perspectives on life through my life experience. So I never want people to feel that I think that I'm right or what I say is absolutely how it is. It's, it's all about perspective and it's all about what we've experienced through life that leads us to, I guess, act in a certain way or believe certain things. And for me, um, you know, there's a picture of me on my horse with my sister, um, well, our horse, riding her to school. Uh, I lived in Ross on the west coast of the South Island. I, uh, you know, it was great, um, incredible environment to grow up in. Rural communities are the absolute best. My sister tells a great story about being eight years old, being up in the forest with a machete and her pony and her friend, and they were cutting new tracks. I um, mean, you just kind of, I guess, I don't know, maybe people still do that, but I can't, I couldn't imagine it now. Um, we got to have adventure, we got to have all these things, and so I'm really passionate about rural communities and protecting them, but I believe the best way to protect them is to help them understand how to evolve and adapt. Um, my parents lost every property to mortgagee sale. So sadly, we, we, we had to move a lot. Um, and, and sadly, we had to move the, away from the West Coast. Now, I'm not criticizing my parents, but they um, did the same thing and were quite shocked when they got the same result. And they would often fight change and fight the world and blame others uh, for situations that they potentially, I guess, behave the, themselves into. And not because they were bad people or not because they didn't try. Often it was just they didn't understand or know. Um, and then I went into rural banking many years later and I was sitting on the other side of the table from people who were losing, you know, occasionally, not often, but occasionally were losing farms and were, you know, using the same language that mum and dad used in regards to it being other people's fault you know it, it being about change coming and change was kind of ruining everything instead of actually um and what I learned was when when you find so much time to not change or fight change even the inevitable change uh you exhaust yourself so much that you have nothing left to adapt when you need to and I think the sad thing is we actually don't get to choose the pace of change I think we believe we do uh, but we don't. If we delay change, it will hit us at some point, but the pace of change is not the thing that we get to choose, but the process in which we change often is. Um, I also don't try and pretend to be a farmer. This is my uh, current herd. Um, as you can see, I have no idea about farming. Those two cattle beasts will be pets for the rest of their lives because they're cuddly and they come when I call them, so I now can't eat them. And I have a small miniature pony that wants to kill me on most occasions and a mentally insane ex-racehorse that thinks he's going to be called up anytime soon to get in the next race. So, you know, again, I, this is not about understanding farming. This is about having a beautiful appreciation for the value of farming and understanding the supply chain. But I'm not trying to tell you how to farm and I'm certainly not here to tell you um, what what you need to do as far as technical things with farming and I'm sure if you ever talk to any of my neighbours they would reassure you also that I should never be teaching anyone how to farm because um, I certainly give them a bloody good laugh every day. Now I want to just start looking at the exports for New Zealand and, and I think that the reason I'd like to look at this is just simply that it is really important for New Zealand that we have this export income. Uh, it's, it's significant and we should be proud of it but we should also know that it is in fact uh, less than 2% of the total globe, global food system. So the total global food system is about 8 trillion US dollars. We earn 47, or I think it was 48 billion um, New Zealand dollars. And so, you know, we aren't going to feed the world. And, and I hear that quite often still, and I'm, I'm always quite shocked when I hear it. We're not going to feed the world. We're never going to feed the world. There's no intention of feeding the world. But because we 
are small. It means that we actually have this fantastic ability to be quite agile, to be in niche markets, uh, to actually be a little bit more adaptable and a little bit more agile. And I think that's a huge positive. Here's the bigger breakdown of where those imports come from, uh, exports, sorry, values come from. And it's really important too to remember that, yes, we do need to protect this income. And that's why often some of this change, and I hear often people fighting change because they say it'll be bad for the income, but we need to actually think about protecting that income. And to protect it, it is about adaption and, and evolution because ultimately customers change. You know, customers change all the time. Um, New Zealand is really respected and, and, and we should never lose sight of that. I think we've got into this real habit in New Zealand at the moment. One, we are far out, we complain way too much. It's, you know, it's really unhealthy how much New Zealanders complain now, regardless of sector, right? We work very much in the corporate sector through NZX and, you know, same thing across the corporate sector too. I think New Zealand in general, we've, we've kind of got into this state of moaning and complaining, but the reality is there's lots of good. And, you know, one of the things is we are strongly respected um, for our reputation of producing food around the world. Uh, and, and that's hence why we keep have been able to get into markets. You know, we've got loads of water and, and we have to be careful with water. And just because we have lots of water doesn't mean we don't think about our rivers and we don't care about it. And we've got to think about our oceans and everything too. But, you know, for fresh water, we have actually one of the highest levels of available fresh water per capita as well. Um, oops, I went back because I'm sorry. Um, and we actually produce about 10 times the amount of food that, per capita as well. Uh, sadly though, we actually have high obesity rates, we have high malnutrition, malnutrition rates, and we have a lot of people in our country that go without food. Uh, I'm on a board of called Meet the Need, I'm the chair of the board, and uh, that was set up by Wayne, Wayne Langford and Siobhan O'Malley and, and an incredible organization trying to get, um, you know, where farmers can donate beasts through to food banks because we want to make sure that nutrition goes in so we you know although we produce all this amazing food in our country and and fiber you know we actually it's quite hard for us at times to I guess link that back to how well our country is eating and we actually import a lot of shitty food to be honest we export this incredibly nutrient dense incredible food um, offshore like something like 80 to 90 percent of what we produce and fibers um, and we kind of import a load of crap right and eat shit so I think it's something about we do need to shift this significantly I um, mean the other thing now is is the rest of the world are actually seeing New Zealand as quite isolated we were considered quite kind of a cool country we're down the end of the world you know nice spot to visit and now people can't get in and I, I, I do not say that with any level of criticism of how the COVID situation has been dealt with because I think that is is brilliant and, and I'm very grateful that my very old father with lung issues doesn't have to worry too much about getting COVID but the reality of it is in a commercial sense the world is starting to see us a little bit isolated um, when it comes to export. There's a few things we need to think about too because of this so our digital traceability is really important and I think this this to me, in my mind, um, feeds right through into genetics. And so we've got to make sure that whatever we are doing on farm through genetics, through, through any operation, we need to make sure that there's a digital traceability so that when we've got products going offshore through borders, that there is one traceability because that's what governments will demand um, for border access. And two, it's actually what the customer is demanding. And three, it's actually quite a neat way to connect. When you can't get a person in the country it's really cool if we can actually connect them in some other way and we can connect people through that digitizing, connecting them to um, our farms. Uh, the thing is, New Zealand is a little bit funny though because we do think digital is having a Facebook page and it is much, much wider than that. So I guess, you know, do we have, and, and I don't know, I'm sure there'll be a few allergic reactions to this sort of idea, but, you know, imagine in the sharing sheds or um, in even the sheet yards or something that you had a camera rolling and that you, had, you know, and maybe some of you do, but you actually had that rolling so that it was a live feed so people could see what happens and what goes on and really creating some level of digital traceability. Um, food, food insecurity, I've just covered that before. Um, we've seen today that the supermarkets have got hammered again. Um, you know, we need to actually have more channels for food to get into communities and, and through to people, um, even the consumer, um, and, and that food insecurity. You know, we can't feed 40 million people around the world 
uh, which is estimated what we can feed of a portion of their diet uh, and not be feeding the 5 million that are in our own country. So, so there's a lot of work needs to be done in that space. And then border access is something we really do need to think more about. And I know it's not in our control. So I know that uh, we're not, we're not trade negotiators and trade our trade negotiators in New Zealand are really cool so by the time you see like the ministers going and signing those documents it's kind of bullshit because like it's already been done um it's already been like the negotiators have already negotiated it and done all the contracts they're just like wheeled out basically just to sign things off um so our actual negotiators around the world every country is very tight they work hard and they work really well together um but the flip side of border access is making sure that it's going to be what other countries want to have as rules to get food in particular into their country or, or and fibres. And so, you know, one of those things will be carbon. There will be some sort of rules around that. There will be rules around, there already are around many countries around human rights. So um, it was about, I think it was about two years ago, there's a, the Modern Day Slavery Act and there was a big boatload of produce that was actually turned around from Europe uh, because they couldn't, uh, from New Zealand, that they couldn't prove or they didn't have actual digital evidence that they had paid people the fair living wage to pick the fruit. So it's those sorts of things that we need to be kind of conscious of, of what do we need to do? And I think we get quite hung up with a lot of the regulation coming through that it's government, um, just hating farmers or whatever. And, and I don't know, I mean, I'm, I don't hang out with them, right? So I don't know what they like or hate. I think the reality of it is, and this is just my perception through life experiences, they're all quite useless. Um, we give them too much credit, any government, anyway, doesn't matter what colour, who's in, it's going to be the same stuff. And this isn't coming from them, this is coming from um, people that vote for them, this is coming from other people. So we just have to kind of be mindful that they aren't leading, they're actually just reacting to a consumer or a community that is pushing for this. So we need to think about how do we influence those communities and those consumers rather than the government. Um, the supply chain and security, you know, if you're trying to buy stuff right now, it's probably a bloody nightmare for you. Um, it, it is quite hard and, and these ships, container ships, very difficult to get. Uh, it's the, the big freight or the bulk freight is a little bit more difficult at the moment than the container stuff. You know, ships are getting cancelled. Uh, I was at the Red Meat Sector Conference uh, over on Monday and, you know, there were people talking about you know, how difficult it is to actually redistribute your containers with the actual boats getting cancelled at the last minute. So these supply chain things will make people think and they'll probably be a little bit more creative. I do know that some of the planes, I think in New Zealand redesigned, sort of ripped out the seats basically of some of their big planes and there, there is a way to get some produce um, or product up out of New Zealand via air freight as well. So I don't know, maybe in New Zealand needs to buy a boat next. Um, and consumer behaviour change, we need to think about that. You know, we've all just been forced into a different way of living um, and, and maybe not on farm um, in some aspects, but the reality of it is we all would have in some aspects. I mean, look, I'm really lucky. I live in a rural community. Lockdown to me was actually a dream come true. Um, I, had a, I had a blast, you know, I rode my horse at lunchtime and, you know, walked around, walked around my property. I didn't even really never need to leave and I got groceries delivered. But there are things that we did differently. There's be things that people won't change. And I'm sure most people will make sure they're never out of toilet paper. Um, I always keep flour in the house now, which is really weird because I barely even really cook um, or bake. And so, but I ran out of flour and it really annoyed me and I had to bake with coconut flour. And so all of now I just have big bags of flour. So there'll be these random things that people will do and they'll change their behavior really subconsciously because they were forced into different things that they did. Uh, and then we've got to think about climate change and, and you're probably rolling your eyes now going, oh, for the love of God, I wish everyone would shut up about this. The reality of it is it's really going to evolve more. And this is where I think when you think of genetics, there's such an important um, game or part of the game that you can be part, you can play with climate change, you know, when you think of climate change in a supply chain, and, and hopefully um, the big safe guys go through this as well, but it's when you look at climate change, and if you're in, we're all in someone's supply chain. So this is the big thing we've got to think about for New Zealand, right? So whether or not you supply a cooperative or whatever you are supplying with your meat, wool, whatever, um, they will be inside someone else's supply chain. And whatever that company is, that the supply chain that they're in, they will demand that they 
record things like the carbon that it takes to produce something. They will want to understand how much people pay people. So this climate change and all these things, they call it ESG, it's just cheesy corporate talk, but we've really got to get our head around this that we are in fact part of a supply chain. Uh, and we need to be quite conscious of this and make sure that when we're doing things, we are measuring. We must measure. We've got to stop contextually, to, uh, conceptually talking. Um, corporates around New Zealand do these bloody 137 page reports that are just full of scenery. And, and you know, we've got to measure. We've actually got to get a bit real. I think we need a bit of a reality hammer. Um, we can't be super idealistic either because we have to transition for change. Um, we can't turn taps off and we can't completely disrupt communities and environments um, to change, but we can certainly get on the pathway and have a plan for transition. And it's not about necessarily just mitigating climate change. It's actually about making sure that you and your business are resilient through climate change. Because you think about it, right? Like the world, you know, whether you believe in it or not, or whether you think it was hairspray or it's just come about, it, the reality of it is, is that we're getting more rain when we don't need it. We're getting less rain when we desperately need it. We're getting huge weather changes, huge weather patterns. You know, I was reading something tonight where it's snowing in Brazil um, and it's their summer. You know, there's these insane sort of things starting to happen and these shifts around. So I think it's quite important that we start to adapt our farming practices to make sure that we are able to continue to farm purely based off physical ability or the fact that the land will act differently under climate change conditions. And that's when you scenario plan, you start thinking about if it was an, another degree warmer and I couldn't grow a tree there, how much would I have enough shelter and all these other things. Um, and when we think of, of consumers, I kind of want to just rip through these. I mean, don't get upset about alternative proteins or anything like that. It's, you know, I think it's, and that's again back to your genetics, you know, but think about the attributes that the consumer might want. So when we're setting in place genetics, we've got to be really careful. Is it something that you are individually interested in breeding? And that's cool if you are. I'm, this is not a, not a criticism, just an observation. The key is, do you want to do it out of interest sake or are you trying to create an income out of this? And there's going to be sort of a business model thing in there. So you need to think through your business model that it's cool if you want to breed whatever breeds um, because you want to, and that's an interest of you. I think the, you've got to be really careful that if the consumer or there isn't a market for that particular breed or it's not a growing market or the attributes won't fit with the future, then that could be a risk to the business model side of it. So it's kind of really more of an interest rather than an impact. Um, so, you know, diverse pantries, we're going to see people eating different things. We'll have family members, some will be on alternative proteins, some will be on animal only, you know, some families will, will not feed their children and, nor, you know, my personal viewers, nor should you, um, alternative type proteins, you know, because of the lack of actual nutrient in them in comparison to animal proteins, whereas some adults may have animal proteins for for, for vast amount of reasons. We've all heard about the flexitarian, um, you know, I just think of that as, um, I think the best example I heard of that once was a girl at Massey said that you're a vegetarian until you get drunk and then you have a Big Mac on the way home. Uh, these consumers are focusing on immunity and through COVID, it, what, what we learned is those who had a low immune system uh, were at very high risk. So it's really important that people are trying to target their immunity. Um, the social media, look, social media brings people together and does magical things. It can also be quite difficult and demoralizing. So um, example, I spoke in an event, there was a young 16 year old girl, she had a real Greta moment. Um, she was just shaking and yelling at me, telling me that I romanticized um, an industry that pumps their animals full of antibiotics and jams them in small spaces. I had no damn idea what she was talking about. I was like, well, I don't remember. Anyway, I asked her how many farms she'd been on and she'd never been on one. So we've got someone there who is influenced through influence, not influenced through experience. And, and that's what we're battling with a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, it was kind of a bizarre thing. I mean, we got through it in the end, but, you know, she, she had in her mind this belligerence that whatever she'd seen or read was real, but it wasn't even New Zealand. So I think when you, we, we just have to accept that there will be people out there like that. And I mean, we all had dumb ideas at 16. Geez, I had some crazy shit ideas. I wanted to be the president of the United States of America until I was about 20. Um, but, you know, I think in that sense, we're going to have a lot of people that will potentially have an, have an opinion or a view without facts. And um, we've got to be really 
careful how much oxygen we give them and how much air we give back to them um, because they will continue uh, that you know there will be extremists and let's not get hung up on extremists I don't like seeing on Twitter and that where people go oh vegans are dicks and they just hate this and hey vegan you know we can't assume just because someone's a vegan that they have some evil underlying purpose um, they are just making a diet choice which is actually none of our business it is extremists that go crazy and do crazy shit not vegans there's quite a difference. Um, they might be the same at some times, but let's not kind of just put everyone in the same bucket. Transparency, please don't underestimate the importance of transparency. When we have a lack of information for people, they start to make it up. And it is so important that we actually have a great deal of transparency with everything that we do. And, and look, the, the planet-based foods is self-explanatory. Getting away from plant-based foods and making sure people understand the planet-based foods. And this is where, with your genetics, if there are attributes, all of these things, they must be talked about. They must be really obvious and we must get them out there. Um, look, as farmers, again, you know, I'm going to go back to transparency and you're going to get sick of it, but I know that you probably didn't start farming or breeding because you necessarily want to be exposed to the world. You did it because you love what you do and you're really passionate about it. Um, and, and part of it might have been the attraction of isolation with some of the farming spaces as well. But um, it doesn't mean that you have to be a Kardashian. It doesn't mean you have to let people into every part of your life. But the more we can allow people into, I guess, farming, um, to understand farming, the, the more we can actually combat that real extreme view by bringing balance to it. Um, we've got to adapt. And I think, you know, all these three things sit together. When we adapt, let's be really transparent about that adaption. Also, let's be really transparent about the things that we haven't done yet that we need to still do and not be afraid to actually be open about that. And yep, someone's going to climb on you and give you a hassle about it. But th that is just life. We need to actually stick together, be brave and actually adapt, create transparency and then, and then build trust and also learn to trust. I don't think it's just about us. And when I say that we need to build trust in others, please don't take that as an offensive thing that, you know, but no one trusts anyone in the world now. This is not a farmer, non-farmer thing. This is just a human thing. Um, and how do we build trust as humans? How do we reconnect? And a lot of people don't have connection with a farm. So they might, their only connection might be what they read or what they might see on a packet. Um, you know, we've got to take back control of our narrative or our story or and the story has to include reality I think what we miss sometimes is we forget to be real so we we think story means telling people only the good things and please don't get me wrong I love seeing a lamb in a little jacket better than anyone more than anyone but you know I've learned even when vets put stuff up that might be a bit ooh, for me I still read it and I learn about it because it's a way to learn and I think there are things that with our stories we just need to tell the truth and people will start to um, and yes, you can be slightly selective with the truth because we don't want to be, you know, telling everything right now. But there's the difference between trying to force information down people's throats and also helping them understand what do they want to, what do they want to know. Um, and we really need this integrated collaboration. We need to work together. That needs we need to be thinking about. And geez, I feel like a broken record. I swear I've talked about this about a fifty bloody thousand times, but well, if not millions, but. Um, it's this collaboration is working together. I think we always try and get solutions in isolation. And this is where we get into danger, right? So if you're doing genetics, surely you're speaking to consumer markets companies to make sure that the genetics that you're working towards that are going to take years actually align with what the future trends are likely to be. Uh, and I know you can't necessarily always pick exactly what those trends are, but there's, there are enough signals to give you kind of some reassurance for a 10 year kind of window. And I think it's about making sure that our sectors are integrating more, that they're working together and that the innovation is actually rewarded on collective um, collective outcomes or collective positive outcomes rather than actually that at the moment we tend to sort of think you know if I talk to dry stock farmers they're like those poor dairy guys geez you know the sunset industry I go talk to dairy farmers and they're like oh those poor dry stock people you know the beef industry is going to be like sunset industry and the reality of it is you know you talk to kiwi fruit and they think everyone should rip every animal out and just stick a bloody plant in it and it's, it's just the reality of it is we actually all win or all lose like there is no one sector that is going to be 
more magical or succeed, I think we need to get in this together. Um, and that's where, again, I think it's important that we do work together. And it is frustrating to work with government in certain parts and, and they might not communicate well. None of, no government does. Um, but we have to learn to work out a way to work with them. Um, we've got to work with our offshore companies to make sure that when we're in their supply chain, that we are identifying and measuring the things that they need to measure to show their investors or their other customers. And we've got to be working in with these to make sure that we actually set ourselves up for success because we, this country is freaking awesome. The way we produce is magnificent and we just don't give ourselves enough credit for it. We are just hung up on complaining right now and we are hung and I know people are tired and I know everyone's overwhelmed but we need to realize that life is about choice and life is is shit and don't get me wrong I lie on the couch and I bore my eyes out on a regular basis and I get overwhelmed and I get really tired but I actually make sure I get myself in the right headspace every day to get up and and take the world on because you know we've got to start looking for solutions and, and stop constantly trying to find problems there will always be problems but we have to go searching for solutions and I feel like I just rambled on if anyone wants to make a complaint about my annoying conversation then you can um, email me or contact me on these details thanks so much Julia some really really great food for thought there and perspectives really appreciate that and um, we've got time for a quick couple of questions um, so one's come through from Annie O'Connell. Uh, so Julia, do you have any insights into how we could tackle the feed our 5 million first? It is an idea that resonates, but we have been dependent on profit from our exports. How do we value ourselves, pay for our own produce first? Yeah, that is, oh God, I wish I had the answer to that question. And look, I'll be honest, with meet the need. Our, our version of success has never been needed. So um, we would love to have no need. Uh, I know that KPMG are working really hard on this and a, a New Zealand food strategy. So one thing we have missing is we don't have a food strategy. And, and that can be part of it. You know, that is also around education. Uh, the scary thing is, is when food bank parcels go out, they're often full of biscuits and chippies and all these things. And it's actually getting nutri nutrient dense foods into our kids and, and oh God, I wish I, I absolutely wish I had the answer for you. Uh, I, I'm concerned that we keep putting a hand out to farmers. Farmers, please take on board how incredibly generous you are. Um, ridiculously generous, because I know that you'll have at least 10 probably different organizations that you're donating something to to provide food. But I think, again, it's about getting government agencies on board. And I think we've tried to solve the food problem within the food sector. And this needs to be a health issue health sector thing it needs to be a ministry for social development thing it needs to be a whole lot of our government agencies need to come together on this as well that was a terrible answer I'm sorry so basically the short answer is I have no idea but I can assure you there are people working on it and I'm certainly banging on about it as much as I can yeah it's a tough question um, another one from Annie does New Zealand have a story to tell about our environmental footprint per capita that we feed rather than per capita that live here Oh, that's such a brilliant question. It's about, again, it's about data and, and measure. So yes, it does, but we don't, I think Ritter Institute with the Delta model, terrible name for a model, by the way, now, but um, it's, um, it wasn't at the time, but no, the Delta model was brilliant that Ritter Institute have got, and they are working really hard to do that whole um, carbon footprint per capita uh, and also put it into nutrient. So nutrition. So I'll give you a random example. So you could either have three glasses of milk or you could have one and a half kilos of broccoli to get some calcium. Um, I know what I'm going to choose. Also, the broccoli wouldn't digest very well in your gut. Certainly give you a green poos. And I think the whole idea there, and it would also stuff up your calorie intake and the rest of the nutrients. So, and then if you look at how broccoli is growing, uh, you know, quite a lot, probably a lot more energy that goes into it with transportation and carbon and stuff like that. So we do need to start breaking down more to nutrient and per capita. But New Zealand actually has a great story to tell about our environment. I think we are just, we just forget to tell people. We do these things and we're so humble and we've almost got to stop being so humble and actually tell people, but not tell people with anger, not tell people with frustration, tell people with pride because if we don't feel proud of what we do and we are waiting for external validation on that, we're never going to get it. So let's just actually have our pride, express pride and show what we're doing. Show how you're planting things out. Show how you move your animals. Show your beautiful paddocks. Show all these things. Show your clean water. 
and just keep showing it and keep showing it and keep showing it. Yeah, it's a great point. And measure, 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 measure. Two great questions. Thanks, Annie. Uh, one more. Um, our exports grew from 36 billion to 47 billion over six years. Did we do that by increasing value rather than production? And will we be able to grow value by another 25% in the next five to 10 years? And how? Yeah, it, well, it is actually a mix of both. So yes, it was some volume. I, I do get, I feel sad for farmers sometimes when we talk about volume, because I know that the pressure was from government, was from industry bodies, it was from everyone, right? I went in a bank and we used to tell people to buy the farms, you can produce more, buy the farm next door or buy the land. So yeah, so some of it, it, it was probably, if we break it down, it's probably mostly volume though. Um, rather than value uh, but some of our value add products and I think we've got to remember that value begins behind the farm gate so when we're adding value to our products it doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be turned into a magical fruit drink or something like that it could be that or, or a, a fancy piece of meat it could in fact be how we market an existing how we've actually bred something or how we've actually grown something or, or the actual contribution to the land that that brings with it so it's really actually going to be about the markets that we're in and the value that we add but we will continue to most likely be more of an ingredient supplier um, or rather than being directly going into these fancy new products yeah great thanks Julia and unfortunately that's our time but thank you very much for joining us again some really great perspectives and I hope everyone's been able to take away a bit of food for thought on on what our futures look like oh look Thanks and if again. anyone has any questions feel free to email me anytime or flip me a text I'm really happy to and also I you know challenge if there's things that didn't make sense that that you challenge me on I think it's great because that's how I learn and I grow so thank you yeah. for the opportunity thanks very much Julia great to have you involved thank you